<laughs> okay, good morning. We're going to do the blessing for studying Torah. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvotav Kutivanu La'asok Divrei Torah. Now I'm going to share with you the, yes, Deuteronomy is where we are. Um, so let me try to move this over. There we go. Okay, we're, I want, to, I, I want to keep the ads off of here. Here we go. All right. So let's start reading here. Um, we're on verse 16, but we can start with 14. Okay. Who would like to read? I'll read, but we're, we're 16. All right. Start at 16 then. Uh, or 14. I said start at 14. That way I'll make it easy. I'm 14. Okay. Yeah. The Lord said to Moses, now the day of your death is near. Call Joshua and present yourselves at the tent of meeting where I will commission him. So Moses and Joshua came and presented themselves at the tent of meeting. Then the Lord appeared at the tent in the pillar of cloud and the cloud stood over the entrance to the tent. And the Lord said to Moses, you are going to rest with your ancestors and these people will soon prostitute them, themselves to the foreign gods of the land they are entering. They will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them. And in that, and in that day, I will become angry with them and forsake them. I will hide my face from them and they will be destroyed. Many disasters and calamities will come on them. And in that day, they will ask, have not these dis disasters come on us because our God is not with us? And I will certainly hide my face in that day because of all their wickedness in turning to other gods. Now, now write down this song and teach it to the Israelites and have them sing it so that it may be a witness for me against them. When I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, the land I promised on oath to their ancestors, and when they eat their fill and thrive, they will turn to other gods and worship them, rejecting me and breaking my covenant. And when many disasters and calamities come on them, the song will testify against them because it will not be forgotten by their descendants. I know that they are disposed to, I know what they are disposed to do even before I bring them into the land I promised them on oath. So Moses wrote down this song that day and taught it to the Israelites. The Lord gave this command to Joshua, son of Nun, be strong and courageous for you will bring the Israelites into the land I promised them on oath and I myself will be with you. After Moses finished writing in a book the words of this law from beginning to end, he gave this command to the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. There, there it will remain as a witness against you. For I know how rebellious and stiff-necked you are. If you have been rebellious against the Lord while I'm still alive and with you, how much more will you rebel after I die? Assemble before me all the elders of your tribes and all your officials so that I can speak their, these words in their hearing and call the heavens and the earth to testify against them. For I know that after my death, you are sure to become utterly corrupt and to turn from the way I have commanded you. In days to come, disaster will fall on you because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord and arouse his anger by what your hands have made. Thank you, Susie. That was a lot to read. So a few things are going on here. 
So we just read that, first of all, and that's what we're going to focus on, that Moses is going to die. This is his mm -hmm. time. The time has come. God's letting him know. Uh, but also, of course, a reminder of how stiff-necked we are, right? In other words, mm. you know, Hebrew, again, is a very concrete uh, language. So instead of saying stubborn, you say stiff-necked. Okay, someone's trying to call me. Um, Stiff. So, you know, despite all the warnings that God has given, that Moses has given, all the warnings about the punishments we're going to receive mm. or all our terrible misdeeds, what happens? We're going to be rebellious. We're not going to be loyal to God. And we have to be reminded yet again that we're going to be horribly punished, but somehow that's not going to work anyway. And so that's, this gets repeated over and over again, mm. right? I mean, if, you know, the rest of the, of the, the Bible is going to be, you know, especially in the book of the prophets, how we're constantly straying, hmm. punished, coming back, straying, punished, coming back. That's sort of the Deuteronomic history, starting with Joshua. So that's kind of uh, a little depressing. But um, anyway, what, what I want to focus on is, okay, you know that God has shown Moses, the land that he's not going to be allowed to go into, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of a little mean, but there it is. Um, and as I said, I think existentially, the fact that we never get to the promised land tells us what life is like. But now let's look at, at uh, Moses. So this is all Midrash, okay? This is not in the Bible. Yeah, Jason. There's a reference to the song that he teaches that I might have missed it. What's the song? Do you it's know? the next, it's the next Torah portion. Yeah. Thanks for asking. It is the next Torah portion, Ha'azinu, mm. which is the song. And also because he's also, it says he's writing down this teaching. So in other words, uh, Moses is writing down the whole Torah, including what happens after he dies, which is interesting. And that will cause some even mm. medieval commentators to question whether Moses, in fact, wrote the entire Torah, because how do you write about your death and after your death? I mean, God maybe dictated it to him. Who knows? But the song is Ha'azinu, which we'll, we'll do next time. Hmm. Yeah. That's a good question, because obviously it doesn't say. Yeah, go ahead. Well, and there's, there's something that I noticed in there that I don't, I can't recall if it's exactly a difference from the previous sections where they talk about all the bad things that'll happen if they violate the law. But this time, God isn't saying if. He's saying you will like it's 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 pre, it's not it's ordained it's going to happen right, right? exactly if you believe that God knows everything that's going to happen in the future then you you know you know it's going to happen it's not a question of if you don't follow these commandments then these bad things will happen it's you will not be following these and these bad things will happen right that is correct um so it's you know it's not like God is going to make us do that. It's just that God knows it's going to happen because God is all knowing, supposedly. Although <clears throat> there are places in the Torah where God is all knowing, and there are places where clearly God is not all knowing. Could it but, be, Rabbi, because he God felt that men will do evil? Yes. Anyway. Yes, absolutely. You know, we have the Yitzhar Harah, the Yitzhar Hatov, the tendency to good, the tendency to evil, the other way around. Does that have anything to do with the, what they did with the golden calf too? Well, the golden calf was, you know, the sort of uh, supreme example of, yeah. uh, you know, being yeah. completely rebellious and not keeping our faith with God. Yeah. And as Moses says, you know, if you were, you know, this way when I was alive, how much more so after I die when I'm right. not here to, you know, keep you in line? Not that he managed to keep them in line very well. Yes, absolutely. So this is interesting because, you know, Moses is our sort of hero, right? Mm -hmm. He gets punished. He can't go into the promised land, but you'd think he'd be kind of gracious in death or as he approaches death. And that's not how the rabbis understand it. So let's share this material. All right. So here is... Okay, there's no other God, I deal uh, death and give life. I wounded, I will heal, none can deliver from my hand. <clears throat> so the blessed one said to Moses, Moses, whose son are you? He replied, son of Amram. That was, you know, the, at the beginning of Exodus, it said this Levite had, uh, you know, 
had a child. Hmm. Amram is a son of whom? He replied, son of Kehat, said the blessed Holy One. Are any of them still alive? He replied, all have died. Said to him, the blessed Holy One, and you want to live? In other words, hmm. clearly Moses is already saying, I don't want to die. And he's saying, well, didn't your father and your grandfather die? Like, what's your problem? Why should you be different? He replied, master of the universe, the first person stole and ate against your will and you sentenced him to death. But I, did I ever steal anything from you? So in other words, the death sentence was a you know punishment in Moses's eyes. I did never steal, that guy stole and he got to die. Well, I've never stolen. And you even wrote about me, my servant Moses, most trustworthy in my house, how then can I die? said God, are you greater than Abraham, whom I tested with 10 trials? So Abraham went through 10 really tough trials. What was the last trial that he went through? What was Abraham's final trial? Sacrifice of uh, Isaac. Right, he was told to sacrifice his son. Now, you know, he, that guy passed that incredible test and died. So what do you think, you're better than him? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he replied, Abraham fathered Ishmael, whose descendants enslaved your children. In other words, Ishmael was one of Abraham's sons, and uh, he ended up being, you know, the father of the Arabs. And, you know, I guess he's sort of saying he's uh, responsible for the uh, Israelites being slaves. So therefore, Abraham was punished for having such a son. He said, God, are you greater than Isaac? And he replied, Isaac fathered one who will destroy your house. I'm sorry. Yeah, Ishmael, right. Uh, Isaac fathered one who will destroy your house and his son will kill your son. So, you know, Esau is the uh, progenitor of all sorts of awful people, including Rome. So Isaac is being uh, punished for that reason. So the blessed Holy One says to Moses, did I order you to kill the Egyptian? So remember the first time we see Moses as an adult, he kills uh, a grown up Egyptian slave master. Mm -hmm replied Moses, you killed all the firstborn of Egypt. Yeah. So da da da, I did something not even as bad as what you did. Yet I'm to die because of one Egyptian? You killed all these little babies? Mm. And the Holy One says to him, are you comparable to me killing and giving life? Can you give life as I do? So this is a, a pretty interesting little midrash about, yeah. you know, uh, Moses, you think you're better than any, anybody else, you know? And, and it looks like everybody died because of some kind of sin that they committed, right? Just like the original so-called sin, right? Mm -hmm. We were gonna be immortal maybe if we hadn't eaten of the fruit of the tree. And God gets to work under different rules from the rest of us. Just like some people we know who think they can operate under different <laughs> rules, right? Okay. Now this, so that's one midrash, you know, this kind Best of argument. Best time to compare those two. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, indeed. So anyway, you know, this is one midrash about, you know, Moses is trying an argument, you know, like, okay, listen, hey, why do I, you know, did I do anything so terrible? Yeah, you killed somebody. So, and, and Moses has the chutzpah to compare himself to God, mm -hmm. right? Right. God get, also gives life. So, hey, you're not comparable. Okay. So this is the day that God speaks to Moses. Ascend these heights to Mount Nebo. Okay. And you'll see the land of Canaan. You'll die in the mountain that you're about to ascend and you'll be gathered to your kin. That means you're going to die. And Aaron just died. When Moses realized that the decree of death had been sealed against him, he drew a small circle around himself, stood in it and said, master of the universe, I will not budge from here until you void that decree. So sort of like a petulant child, I am not going to leave this little circle until you, you know, get rid of this edict that I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. At the time he donned sackcloth and that's what you put on when you're in mourning. Indeed, wrapped himself in it, strewed ashes upon himself, and persisted in prayer and supplications before the Holy One until heaven and earth, indeed, all things made during the six days of creation, were shaken. What did the Holy One do then? She, he, had it proclaimed at every gate of every firmament that Moses' prayer be not accepted nor brought up to God's presence because the decree concerning him had been sealed. In other words, you can pray all you want, it's not going to get to me, right? 
mm -hmm. keep the angels from you know bringing these these prayers to me because the decree has been sealed it's done moses said to the holy one master of the universe known and revealed to you is the trouble and pain i suffered on account of israel until they came to believe in your name so in other words hey look what i did for you right mm -hmm. hey, here were these complaining people and they kept straying, but I brought them to the point where they really believe in you. How much pain I suffered because of them until I inculcated among them the Torah and its precepts. I mean, this is like, you know, a teacher trying so hard to teach a bunch of recalcitrant students, but he manages in the end to do it. I said to myself, as I witness their woes, so will I be allowed to witness their good fortune. So, I mean, I've seen them go through 40 years in the desert. I should also be able to see them thriving in the land of Israel. Yet now that Israel's good fortune has come, you tell me you shall not go over this Jordan. Thus your Torah, which asserts in the same day, you shall give him his hire. In other words, there's a law in the Torah that says, if you hire somebody, you have to pay them right away. You can't delay until morning. And he's saying, my pay is to be able to go into the land of Israel, and see my people enjoying it and enjoy it myself. Um, so you, you turn that into a fraud. You said, pay them the same day, but now you're saying I can't be you know, recompensed for what I did. Is such the reward for 40 years of labor that I labored until Israel became a holy people? You know, this is the thanks I get for everything I did? The holy one replied, nevertheless, such is the decree that has gone forth from my presence. Then Moses said, master of the universe, if you will not let me enter the land of Israel, Allow me to remain alive like the beasts of the fields who eat grass, drink water, and thus savor the world. Let me be like one of these. At that, God replied, enough. Speak no more to me of this matter. But Moses spoke up again. I mean, I'm sure, I think most of you have children. I don't, but you know, you say to a child, no, and they say, but, 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 no, and stop asking. But, right? He's acting just like a kid here. But Moses spoke up again, master of the universe. If not like a beast of the field, then let me become like a bird that flies daily in every direction to gather its food and in the evening returns to its nest. Let me be like one of these. The Holy One replied again, enough. He's not done though. Then the Holy One said to Moses, Moses, I've sworn two oaths, one concerning Israel. After they did that deed, which is the spies episode, remember he, they send spies into the land of Canaan. They come back, they say, we're like grasshoppers. We can't um, overcome them. And so that makes God very angry because they're supposed to have faith that God's going to let them conquer the land. So after they did that, uh, God said, I'm going to destroy them from the world. And the other oath that he took or that God took is you're to die and not enter the land. Now, the oath I had sworn concerning Israel, I set aside at your plea when you entreated me. Pardon, I pray to you. And now you entreat once again that I set aside my oath to comply with your plea. Let me go over, I pray to you. So in other words, the first oath, which is I'm going to destroy these people for the spies episode. And Moses intercedes and says, please don't do that. These, you know, these people, what, you know, not a good idea to get rid of them for many reasons. And God says, okay. I will do as you say. But now you're telling me another oath I should let go. No. You seize the well's rope at both ends, do you not? If you wish to have the second one fulfilled, you must nullify the first. In other words, now you get to choose. I can destroy all the people, that was my first oath, or you. But I'm not going to do both. When Moses, our teacher, heard this, he said, Master of the universe, let Moses and a thousand like him perish but let not a fingernail of one person in Israel be hurt. So he's willing to die so that the rest of the people do not die. Said the Holy One, such was, was my thought from the very beginning and such must be the way of the world. Each generation is to have its own interpreters of scripture. Each generation is to have its own providers. Each generation is to have its own leaders. Until now it had been your portion to serve me, but now your disciple Joshua's portion to serve has come. Moses said to the Holy One, master of the universe, if I must die to vacate my post for Joshua, let me be his disciple in my remaining hours. The Holy One replied, if that is what you wish to do, go and do it. I'm gonna stop sharing for just a moment.
because this, this is very important right here. Uh, I mean, we talked last time about the fact that leadership has to change at a certain point, that you can't hold on to your power forever, that the next generation has to be able to take over. And so that's an important uh, idea right here. But beyond that, it's something the rabbis are saying about their role. So what do you think the rabbis are saying? Because they wrote this. What are they saying about themselves? Well, Lador Vador is a very, um, a very instructive here, isn't it? Um, yes. they, we, um, we put our faith and our trust and our hopes and our expectations in the next generation. And just like Moses, the rabbis are going to have to give up their power to younger rabbis. Well, that's interesting. Uh, that's the conclusion of this. Absolutely. I'm not sure they're <laughs> focusing on that part of it right now, but that's absolutely uh -huh. true. Yes. I mean, but what are they saying uh, about themselves? I mean, Moses represents the Torah, right? He mm -hmm. supposedly wrote, the, yes, Jason. Well, it seems like they're saying they're the ones who inherited that role as, in, as interpreters of scripture in their generation and that they are descended from Moses and Joshua in that role, perhaps. Absolutely, they're absolutely. They're waiting they're themselves. Yeah. They're what? He's been a good teacher, but they're now it's time to move on. Yeah, it's time to move on. And Jason, what were you saying? No, I was saying they're putting themselves at that level of the highest, um, you know, interpreters. And so they're giving themselves that mantle. Absolutely. So what they're saying is, hey, you know what? Yeah, we got the Torah. That supposedly is the word of God. I mean, we're not saying it's just some document there or even that Moses wrote it on his own. It's God's word. But we are the ones who have to interpret it now. I mean, there are a couple of wonderful stories in the Midrash that express this. So one is the oven of Achnai, which some of you probably know or remember, where the, the rabbis are arguing about whether or not this oven is kosher or not. It's got like, oh. Achnai is a, a serpent. So it's got these sort of uh, spiraled or circular uh, pieces interwoven with others. Now, I don't remember who said what, whether the majority of the rabbis say it's kosher and um, Eliezer says no or whatever, it doesn't matter. So let's say Eliezer says it's not kosher and the majority of the rabbis say it is. So Eliezer said, if I'm right, let this river run backwards. And the river runs backwards and the rabbis say, that doesn't matter. We don't care what the river's doing. So Eliezer said, if I'm right, let this tree fall down and the tree falls down. And they say that doesn't convince us either. And then a voice from heaven comes out and says, Eliezer is correct. And the rabbis say, we don't care, majority rules. <laughs> In other words, we are the ones who are interpreting this now. We don't care. I mean, they care, but you know, there's no God to tell us now what it means. We're going to say what it means, right? I mean, God is there, but God is not speaking anymore, right? Prophecy has ended. And then to top it all off, the end of the story is God is laughing, saying, my children have defeated me. My children have defeated me. In other <laughs> words, God is perfectly thrilled to have the rabbis take on this responsibility right now. And that's what they're doing here. They're saying it is up to us. And then the other wonderful story is um, Moses is watching God put the little crowns on the letters in the Torah. You know, if you look at a Torah scroll, there are little crowns on some of the letters. And Moses says to God, well, what are those crowns? And God says, one day there's going to be a rabbi who's going to interpret the Torah even up to the the crowns on the on the letters. And Moses says, well, let, can I see who, who that is? I mean, I, I'd like to meet this guy. So God sends him forward into time. And he's sitting in the back of Akiba's, Rabbi Akiba's Academy. Mm -hmm. And Akiba is doing all this interpretation of the Torah. And Moses is totally lost, has no idea what he's talking about, right? 
And one of the students says to Akiba, where do you get this, you know, halacha from, this, these laws from, and these interpretations? And Akiba says, from Moses. In other words, the oral law was also handed down at Mount Sinai, right? All these interpretations were also handed down on Mount Sinai. That's what the, the rabbis are giving themselves, this authority from Sinai, that, that all of this was in the original Torah and was meant to be found by them. I won't tell you the end of the story because it's too depressing, but anyway. Um, so this is a bit of a chutzpahdik move to say, hey, you know, we have that authority. It's wonderful, and you know, but it's, this is also what they're saying here. Like, you know what? We're the ones who are now in charge of this. Because hmm. Moses is gone, you know? And all the ones coming after. And then, yes, as, as uh, I think a couple of you said, once these guys die, it's up to the next group. Which is, you know, kind of why, in a way, Reform Judaism really is completely in line with Judaism in terms of interpretation, right? We've always interpreted, interpreted, interpreted. Reform has gone a little bit further than some other denominations. It doesn't make us illegitimate. It makes us completely in line with what has happened for you know, hundreds of years. Um, any other comments before we read some more? Okay, these, these rabbis are, I'm telling you, they have a lot of chutzpah. <laughs> the way they reread this stuff is sometimes they will uh, they change the vowels in a word, they change the order of the consonants. Um, you know, they're they're just really loose, loose with how they, they do this. Although they do feel that it's it was written in such a way as we interpreted this way. Not this way, 15 different ways, right? It's always a lot of opinions to share. Okay. So Moses rose early to be a Joshua. So, oh, by the way, one more thing. Moses is not only allowing himself to be replaced by Joshua, he's now saying, I wanna be Joshua's student. So those of you who talked about learning from the younger generation, right? Mm -hmm. Not only is it time for them to step up, but we can learn from them. I was sort of briefly talking about this last night um, when I was talking about the whole, issue of transgender, which, you know, the, the sort of gender spectrum that is now, you know, what younger people are talking about is something that is, I mean, for, I know for me difficult because it is not something I grew up with, but, you know, we have to be open to the next generation and how they are understanding life. And, you know, when you're brought up a certain way, you know, your brain sort of gets solidified to uh, understand categories in a certain way. And then, you know, got to shatter them. And that's, that's hard. Um, but that's how we learn from the next generation because they have new insights that we didn't have. One hopes anyway. Okay. So, so now Moses is going to become Joshua's disciple. So Moses rose early to be at Joshua's doorway where Joshua sat and interpreted scripture. In order to hide his identity, Moses stooped and put his hand over his heart, thus covering his face with the crook of his arm. So, you know, kind of like this. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, when people came to Moses' doorway to study Torah and asked, where is our teacher Moses? They were told he rose early and went to Joshua's doorway. They went and found him at Joshua's doorway. Joshua seated and Moses standing. They said to Joshua, what has come over you that you allow our teacher Moses to stand while you sit? I mean, obviously one is supposed to be very deferential to one's teachers. You know, you never teach something in front of your teacher. You never contradict your teacher. And here is Joshua sitting while Moses is standing. And they're like, what is going on? When Joshua's eyes were again clear and he recognized Moses, he rent his garments, cried out and wept, my master, my master, my father, my father. Then the people said to Moses, Moses, our teacher, teach us Torah. He replied, I no longer have the authority. They said, we will not leave you. Then a divine voice came forth and commanded the people, be willing to learn from Joshua. With that, the people submitted to the command to sit and learn from Joshua's mouth. When they went out, Moses walked at Joshua's left and as they entered the tent of meeting, the pillar of cloud came down and formed a partition between the two. After the cloud departed, Moses went over to Joshua and asked, what did the word say to you? In other words, 
Now God is speaking directly to Joshua and not to Moses. So Moses has to ask Joshua what God said to him. Joshua replied, when the word used to reveal itself to you, did I know what it said to you? Whoa. Okay. In other words, you had your private relationship with God. <laughs> you didn't necessarily tell me what God told you. So, hey, why do you expect me to tell you? <laughs> pretty, pretty arrogant, but hey, you know. In that instant, Moses cried out in anguish and said, rather a hundred deaths than a single pang of envy. Master of the universe, until now I sought life, but now my soul is surrendered to you. So he's feeling like, you know what it's like to give up your position. Mm -hmm. You feel envious of the younger person. Uh, you feel something important has been taken away from you and all that. And he, he doesn't want to feel that way, right? I mean, he's, he's a decent guy. And now he's convinced that it's time to go. A divine voice came forth and said, the time has come for you to depart from the world. Moses pleaded with the Holy One, Master of the universe, for my sake, remember the day when you revealed yourself to me at the bush. For my sake, remember the time when I stood on Mount Sinai 40 days and 40 nights. I beg you, do not hand me over to the angel of death. Even though he said he's ready, he's not ready once again, right? Mm -hmm. Again, a divine voice came forth and said, fear not, I myself will attend you and your burial. So, you know, God is going to be the one to take care of him. That's not good enough. Moses pleaded, then wait until I bless Israel on account of the warnings and reprimands I heaped upon them. They never found any ease with me. Remember, Moses was admonishing them all the time, so they're probably not too fond of him. But he wants to at least give them a blessing before he goes. Then he began to bless each tribe separately. But when he saw that time was running short, he included all the tribes in a single blessing. Then he said to Israel, because of the Torah and its precepts, I troubled you greatly. Now, please forgive me. They replied, our master, our Lord, you are forgiven. In their turn, they said to him, Moses, our teacher, we troubled you even more. We made your burden so heavy. Please forgive us. Moses replied, you are forgiven. This is very poignant, you know, that he wants to have, you know, a final reconciliation with the people before he goes. And the fact that he doesn't want to die, I mean, hey, you know, it, it shows it shows his humanity, right? I mean, mm -hmm. people don't want to die. And, you know, he feels like, okay, I've only kind of accomplished half of what I was set to accomplish, right? Because people are, you know, the people have gone through this rough time and I can't even see them, you know, finally enter the land, much less see myself entering the land. So it's, it's, it's kind of sad, you know, and, um, you know, God is not, like all that kind to him about it, except at the very end saying, I'll take care of you. And actually God kisses him in the end. It's the kiss of death. Oh, <laughs> I guess you could call it the kiss of death. Um, but it's, it's, it's later on, we'll, we'll read about that later. So um, any, any comments before we continue reading more about his final days? Hi. Yes. That I was thinking about, you know, we always hear that Moses is the greatest example of humility, <clears throat> but it feels as though the rabbis, at least in this midrash, have not painted him with that brush, and they've made him a person of ego and a person uh, with, you know, a much a much greater sense of himself versus the people who he's been tasked to lead, and made it you know, was this about him or was this about them? And he's making it about himself as opposed to about the people, which is not really the proper balance of humility for a leader. And sure. so I find it interesting that the rabbis are characterizing, I mean, obviously this is not what's in the actual Torah, this is their story, but they've sort of taken a chunk out of that tale <laughs> by giving him this much, you know, arrogance, really. Well, you know, I'm not do you think it's arrogance or do you think it's the fact that he feels that he has done a lot and that he would like the opportunity um, and so he he argues for it and uh, it's I don't know that it's totally arrogant but it's some it's a deep wish that he has and you know it, it's hard to know it's hard to know I guess it depends on how we interpret what it says. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree with you, Ruth. Um, I, I'm not so sure it's arrogance as much as desperation. 
Right. You know, when you're like in a situation that you are really sort of out of uh, options, you grab it, whatever. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't I do this for you? Didn't I do that? And didn't this guy do worse? And, you know. Um, I also think there's a desperation in the, the task he was tasked with, he doesn't feel is completed. Yeah. You know, I'm leaving this earth and I haven't done what you asked me to do. Yes, good point, point. And, um, you know, and not to mention the fact that, you know, it's clear that he's a human being, right? That there's nobody in the Torah who is perfect, not even God. And so that's, that makes it very real. Um, but, you know, again, it, it, this is the rabbi's interpretation. So I guess we have to wonder what the rabbi's motivation is in, in portraying him this way. And remember the former portion that we read, which I loved really, was choose life. You know, just no matter what, make the choice to do something good with your life as long as you can. And he thinks he still can do something. Maybe he can't, and it's God's decision, but he's trying to choose life, you know. That's excellent. So, no. excellent point, excellent point. God did just say, choose life. And now he's saying, by the way, you're gonna die now. Even if he's 120. Right, yeah, <laughs> exactly. He is old. Yeah. But you know, time listen, to go. Huh? <laughs> no, but listen, you know, 120 then is not 120 now. And yeah, I know. I mean, look at, look at our congregation. We have a lot of older people. They're vital, yeah. right? Right. And here we are. Here we are, <laughs> you know. Uh, Before you, guys, you know I mean, it'll be 120. A, you're not 120, <laughs> but you know, I think in the last, you know, a generation or two ago, somebody who's in their 80s might not, you know, be as active and vital as, as people in our congregation are, right? Um, mm -hmm. Things are different now, but also people have different abilities. You know, I, I uh, did a sermon a few years ago about people in their 90s who are very active. I don't know if any of you saw that HBO documentary, uh, sort of a documentary that um, was hosted by Carl Reiner. Yes. Oh, oh it's yeah, wonderful. Yeah. And if you if you haven't seen it, try to get a hold of it. It's um, yeah. I can't. Remember, I think something like you know if if I'm not in the if you're not in the obit, have breakfast. Something like that. That was a Carl Reiner saying. You know, he looks at the obit every day, and if he's not in it, he has breakfast. Um, but it's all these people in their 90s who were so active, artists and writers, and you know, okay, let in most cases, I think they're fairly wealthy, so they can afford the best health care. And they can afford all kinds of assistance, but still, you know, uh, they're not sitting in a rocking chair, you know, waiting to die. They're out there living, mm -hmm. and that, and you know, having a goal is one way to keep as vital as possible. So, you're right, Ruth. I think I think that um, Moses feels like I've got more in me. Mm -hmm. I've got more to give, um, which is actually a good way to die, as opposed to I really have had nothing to give for ten years. You know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. I mean, but yeah, having a goal and having a purpose is really important to, to keeping vital if you can. So Jason, are you convinced or do you still think he's arrogant? <laughs> no. Well, I think there's a piece of both, but I'm also yeah. kind of I'm 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 toying with another idea, which is whether or not this tests Moses's faith in the world to come as well, because there's a lot to be said that if you believe what's being promised that you would be able to witness the people in Israel and and mm -hmm. be and enjoy the blessing of watching them go and it wouldn't matter whether or not you had the earthly existence if you believe in that and it questions whether or not Moses really believes that he's going to get to see it in some other form but be present but he wants to be a beast on the ground he wants to be a bird it's like anything to have a glimpse but he doesn't really have the faith that he'll get any appreciation once his earthly life is done, which is something a lot of us struggle with. It's a very real challenge of, we wanna believe that there's something that's gonna allow us to have that ability, but we don't know. And when we get close to the end, maybe we cling to it, but we're not so sure what's gonna happen. So we don't know. And we get worried about it and we want, please let me just see it here because I know I can see it here. Hmm. But you know, the, the idea though about the world to come is not really, it's definitely not in the Torah. So, 
I mean, assuming he could see into the future when rabbis talk about the world to come, but it's not really there. There's a little bit in like Daniel and a little bit in Ezekiel. I mean, it, it's just not really, it's more of a, a, a rabbinic notion mm. um, about the world to come. Um, okay, let's, let's look at a little more about his ending. I don't mean to be grim today by just focusing on death, but there you have it. Okay, so Rashi presents the uncertainties that arise when one tries to discover who it was that buried Moses. So you know we don't know where Moses is buried, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we haven't gotten to that place, but we don't know. No. And that seems to be on purpose, which is that we don't want to have a shrine to somebody. You know, also the traditional Haggadah does not mention Moses' name because we don't want to turn him into a, a, a semi-god. Don't want to worship him. Exactly, right. exactly. So both suggestions make us wonder, but leave it clear that his burial occurred in an unnatural way. Okay, so the place of his burial. So the place where Moses was buried. At first sight, the Torah appears to give us precise information, but Rashi's commentary, based on some stuff, makes it clear that we are not dealing with a physical location that can be identified. Notwithstanding Ibn Ezra's commentary on this verse, it is quite clear that where Moses died, there he was buried. Well, just because he died on a mountaintop doesn't mean he was buried there, we don't know. So the following Midrash illustrates the difficulty in identifying the place of burial. No one knows his burial place. That's a little bit later in the Torah. Some say that even Moses did not know his burial place as it is written and no one, Ish, which means man, knows his burial place. Ish refers to none other than Moses. Well, that's an interpretation. It says no one knows his burial place. Why would that be Moses who doesn't know it? But in Numbers, it says the man, Ish, Moses, was very humble. So you see what they do? Since Ish referred to Moses in one place, they're saying Ish refers to Moses here as well. The Roman emperor even sent two army units, charging them, go and see where Moses is buried. They went and stood up above and saw it down below. Then they went down below and saw it above. So they split up half above and half below. Those above saw it when they looked down and those below saw it when they looked up. <laughs> Hence it is said, no one knows his burial place. Okay, so this, you know, this shows you truly the way the rabbis play with stuff because clearly no one knows where Moses is buried. It does not refer to Moses, but they know their Torah really well. And they know that somewhere else it says Moses. So they, you know, he doesn't even know. And by the way, even when, the armies went out to find it, they couldn't find it. As is characteristic of the sages homilies expressing abstract ideas through a concrete story and leaving the reader to draw the abstraction, the place of Moses' burial being unknown expresses not only the humility that characterized him in his life, Jason, no, <laughs> and as it turns out also in his death, but also the miraculous element in his burial, perhaps buried by the Holy One, blessed be he. So, Again, as I've said many times, Hebrew and the Hebrew mind is very concrete. You say you have a stiff neck, you don't say someone is stubborn. Here you say, we don't know where Moses was buried, which really means a, a larger concept. Humility supposedly on Moses's part, um, something miraculous about him, which of course would make his whole story less than humble because God did a special thing for him. It also does away with any spatial conception of where Moses' remains lie. The spiritual person seeking Moses will see him according to his own elevation, either on the summit or in the valley and has no need of a grave. So this concrete story about these Romans looking for the burial place that some saw it above, some saw it below. If you take that away from the concrete story, it's about how we understand Moses. And you know, do we see him in an elevated way? So all of this can be understood on more of a spiritual level. It's not really meant to be taken literally like the Romans are actually looking for Moses' burial. Maybe what they were looking for in, I mean, maybe what this really is trying to tell us is that the Romans who are not spiritually and ethically elevated in their view were looking for some way to connect to the ethics and the spirituality of, of Judaism. Maybe that's one way to read that. A reason for this obscurity regarding his burial is presented in Raul Boggs' commentary on the verses at hand. This matter was very miraculous. The Torah attempted to elucidate the place of his burial 
as much as possible in the land of Moab, is saying, in the land of Moab, in the valley near Beth Peor. And yet with all this, the Holy One, blessed be he, devised that no one knows his burial place, so that subsequent generations not go astray and worship him as a god. Because by the way, for the uh, Kabbalists, you know, people who are the, the more, you know, mystical uh, followers of Judaism, mm -hmm. they will worship a particular rabbi and literally go to the grave of the rabbi and fling themselves mm -hmm. on the grave. Mm. Well, it's, was it Lori? Lori's grave? Oh, Luria, you mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, there are a whole bunch of them. There's people will go to the grave and it's it's like a whole holy ground. And it's so, in spot, right? He's in spot, yeah. Spot, yeah. yeah. I remember walk, seeing people yeah. walking up to the grave and. Yeah, which, you know, really is not in keeping with what Judaism is teaching us, which is not to do that, right? The Hasidic, don't they do the same thing with their rabbis? Yeah, the, the Kabbalists, yeah. the Hasidic, or the, yeah. That's what they do, you know, a lot of them, you know, because they really, I mean, the, the rabbi that founded their sect becomes, uh, you know, almost like a god to them. Don't they do that to the rabbi in New York? Yep. Uh, what was... But isn't that, an, an, isn't that not correct in Judaism? You're not That's supposed to worship a person. Right. That's what I'm saying. And, and not yeah. to be disparaging of Chabad, but, you know, they really do uh, mm -hmm. have this cult of Schneerson. And they do think he's coming um, back. Schneerson, yeah. 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 But that is why they feel that you need to be buried and not cremated. Because if you're cremated, there's right. no way that you can be resurrected. Right. I mean, this is one of the very strong, strong beliefs of, um, well, Hasidim and ultra-Orthodox, that a burial, I mean, they are so opposed to any kind. Yes. Because today, you know, in modern times, many Jews choose that anyway, you know, not to have a burial. But traditionally, um, if you go and listen to some of the things, they definitely have very strong feelings about burial, not to worship at the, at the site, but that you're in the ground and that at some point, who knows what's going to happen. Like exactly. Jesus? No, no, the, you know, there was is... Resurrected. Yeah, well, the reason they believe that he was resurrected or, you know, was that that was a very strong belief at that time in the first century. Mm. And traditional Judaism does believe in the resurrection of the dead. Mm. Um, yeah. Yes. I mean, yeah. we don't. We believe in the sort of eternal nature of our spirit. And we do. And what you pass on to the next generation. You live that way, not individually, but what goes from generation to generation. Right. But, but traditionally, Judaism does believe in the resurrection of the dead. Hmm. There's a, a scene in Ezekiel. About Ezekiel, the, yeah. Yes. I was going to yeah. ask about Ezekiel. Yeah, yeah, Ezekiel talks about the valley of dried bones and the yeah. and sinews and the muscles all you know get recreated and all these people are uh, made to live again. So that is a belief of Judaism. Reform Judaism does not believe in the resurrection of the dead, but you know, more of the eternal, eternal nature of the soul. So, you know, the idea that Jesus was resurrected was like, yeah, yeah. You know, of course. Of course, you, you don't generally get resurrected three days later, but that's another mm -hmm. story. Okay, let's go back to... Thank you. Um, okay, so the explanation given by Rolbach raises a fundamental problem in the way Moses was perceived in the eyes of the people. The people admired their leader, and there was reason to suspect they might attribute to him a measure of divinity and make his grave or his burial place into a site of idolatry. So that's a reason, supposedly, that his grave is not known. Okay, so now we're back to at the legend about his uh, death. So this is another story about it. Okay, so at the moment, the Holy One, blessed be he, said to the angel of death, go bring me Moses' soul. He went and stood before Moses and said to him, Moses, give me your soul. This is the angel of death speaking to Moses. And Moses answers, where I sit, you have not the right to stand, and you dare say to me, give me your soul? Like, you're not allowed to be in this spot. Thus rebuking him, he left in a huff. The angel of death went and reported back to the Almighty. Again, the Holy One, blessed be he, said to him, go bring me his soul. See, this is like those first stories where, you know, 
Moses is arguing. Then Moses puts a circle around himself and says, you can't get in here. Now he's arguing with the angel of death. You have no right to be here. Get out of here. And the angel of death goes to God and says, he won't let me do anything. And God says, go back. He went back to where he had been, looked for him, but did not find him. So he went to the sea and asked, have you seen Moses? The sea answered, I have not seen him since the day that he caused the Israelites to pass through me. Remember, they went through the Sea of Reeds, yeah. on dry land, hasn't seen him since. So we went to the hills and mountains and asked them, have you seen Moses? They responded, we have not seen him since the day Israel received the Torah. Because that's Mount Sinai, right? They were up on that mountain, haven't seen him since. He went to Gehenna. Now, Gehenna is kind of um, a place for souls to be purified before they you know, go back to the, to the source. And asked, have you seen Moses? Gehenna answered, I've heard of him, but I've never seen him. He went to the ministering angels and asked, have you seen Moses? They said to him, go look among human beings. He went to the Israelites and asked them, have you seen Moses? They answered him, God understood his ways and he hid him away for life in the world to come. And not a living soul knows of him. As it is written, he buried him in the valley. So God sort of hid him. So the angel of death can't find him. Yeah. But isn't God the one that's telling the angels to bring his soul? Yes. But, but he's the one that hid him. Yeah, well, you know, logic doesn't have to factor into this. At least that's how the Israelites understand it, right? We haven't seen him. God hid him away. Okay. When Moses died, Joshua began to cry out in mourning and remonstrate, my father, my father, my rabbi and teacher, my father who raised me, my rabbi who taught me Torah. Thus he mourned him for a long time until the Holy One, blessed be he, said to Joshua, look how you are carrying on mourning. Do you think you're the only one who suffers the death of Moses? It is I who mourn his death, for I have been in great mourning since the day he died. So here's God who said, give me his soul. And yet God is in mourning over Moses. And, he, and he's saying to Joshua, you think you're the only one who's upset? Hey, I'm even more upset than you are. I had to make this happen. And that's the interpretation of the verse, my Lord summoned on that day to weeping and lamenting. However, he was promised to have life in the hereafter, as it is said. See, now they're talking about the world to come and the life in the hereafter, but this is the rabbi saying this, right? You are soon to lie with your fathers and rise. I'm reading the verse which associates the word come, arise with a test. Uh, okay, so, so apparently God, even though God had to make Moses die, he put him in the world to come. In other words, he's gonna live forever in the world to come, which is a concept that's mainly a rabbinic concept. But God is upset about it. Like, you know, it's like, again, like being a parent where you have to punish your kid and, you know, you're, you're more hurt than your kid being punished, right? But, you know, you have to do it. Rabbi, couldn't it mean historically? What do you mean? We know Moses historically. Isn't that sort of maybe reference to the world to come kind of thing? Oh, I see what you're saying. That we, that well, it's, it's passed down from generation. Yes, to generation. I mean, that's how we would understand it, but... I mean, they really literally do believe in, a, in the world right, of right, at the right, end of yeah. history. There's, you know, we're all going to. Yeah, be... I'm, I'm saying our interpretation could be historic. Yes, certainly. But actually, you know, the world to come for the rabbis is sitting around studying Torah. So we're getting a little taste of the world to come right now because this is what they spend their days doing. This is like what they consider to be, you know, wonderful. Not <laughs> having a bunch of virgins, you know, dancing around them, but <laughs> sitting and studying mm -hmm. Torah. Yes, but there are other ways to interpret it. Absolutely. Yeah. Or as Ruth said, it's how we, you know, live out their values. Okay, this midrash serves to fill in the gaps resulting from the obscurity of the text regarding his place of burial and gravesite. The response of the homilist, that's an interpreter, puts in the mouth of the Israelites, God hid him away for life in the world to come, explains that Moses indeed was not buried, but was hidden away as as his brother was talking about Aaron. Yeah, as was his brother his Aaron was stored away in the heavens. That he was hidden away is expressed in the words, no one knows his burial place to this day. Okay, mm -hmm. so he's hidden away by God. So sort of he's not really dead. Eh. The legend presents Moses as human, but also in his abstract form as belonging to the host of heaven and not to those who dwell on earth. Therefore, all the searching that the angel of death did on earth proved fruitless. 
The angel of death in the legend is punished and limited in what he knows, whereas the man Moses is described as a heavenly being who seemingly does not belong with those living on earth. So this is really the opposite in some ways of humility. It's not his own doing, but mm -hmm. that somehow God regards him as a different kind of human being who deserves a special place in the world to come. Okay. Um, okay, the rest of it, I think, is, is kind of repetitive. So let's go to Jonathan Sachs. So Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, as you may know, was the chief rabbi of Great Britain. Mm -hmm. He passed away, unfortunately, um, a couple of weeks ago. Really brilliant, uh, brilliant scholar. Brilliant. Yeah. And there are some of his sayings that are on the internet that are just totally inspiring. <laughs> yes, he's very inspiring and he's very um, down to earth. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and for a modern Orthodox rabbi, he's very uh, inclusive in his you know, understanding of people. Um, there was a controversy at one point because I think there was a kid who wanted to go to a school in England, a Jewish school. And I think he had only, his father was Jewish and they wouldn't accept him in the school. And he defended that, which didn't mm. seem in keeping with his kind of more expansive uh, you know, welcoming of other people, but, you know, again, no one's perfect. Okay, so let's see what he has to say. Okay, the contrast between Abraham's and Moses's death could not be more pointed. Of Abraham, the Torah says, then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. Abraham's death was serene. Though he had been through many trials, he had lived to see the first fulfillment of the promises God had given him. He had a child and he had acquired at least the first plot of land in Israel. Remember the Torah portion from last week, he goes to a lot of trouble and a lot of negotiation to buy the plot of land to bury his, his wife, the, the cave of Machpelah, um, because he wants to have that ownership and not be sort of a guest on the land of other people. Um, so the, there is a sense of closure for Abraham. By contrast, Moses' old age is anything but serene. In the last month of his life, he challenged the people with undiminished vigor and unvarnished candor. At the very moment that they were getting ready to cross the Jordan and enter the land, Moses warned them of the challenges ahead. The greatest trial, he said, would not be poverty, but affluence, not slavery, but freedom. Not homelessness in the desert, but the comfort of home. Remember, he says, you're going to basically grow fat and lazy, and you're going to think that everything that you have is because of your own doing, not because God is behind it. You're going to get arrogant and entitled, and we know that this happens. This is not a, a, a man ready to retire, as we've discussed, right? I'm not ready to go. I want to keep going. Okay, until the very end, he continued to challenge both the people and God. What do we learn from the life and death of Moses? For each of us, even for the greatest, there is a Jordan we will not cross, a promised land we will not enter, a destination we will not reach, right? We discussed this last time, the whole existential statement of ending the Torah on the brink. Because there's some scholarly thought that the book of Joshua was actually included originally. It was six, six books rather than, than uh, five. But there was a decision made to lop it off. So we never get there. That is what Rabbi Tarfon meant when he said, it is not for you to complete the task, but neither are you free to des desist from it. What we began, we will continue. What matters is that we undertook the journey. We did not stand still. No man knows his burial place. What a contrast between Moses and the heroes of other civilizations whose burial places became, become monuments, shrines, places of pilgrimage. It was precisely to avoid this that the Torah insists explicitly that no one knows where Moses is buried. So we talked about the fact that we don't want to worship human beings. No, I was just thinking of, about that. Is that. Isn't that why they buried, um, oh, what's his name, at sea? Who? Oh, yeah, but the terrorist, because they didn't want people to go oh, pray as, as a martyr. Osama yeah. bin Laden. They buried Osama him. Bin Laden. Yeah. There wouldn't oh, be a... Uh... Good point. Good point. Let's see, there's something in the chat. <clears throat> okay, somebody, uh, Suzanne posted in the chat a video from Jonathan Sachs, if you guys want to copy that. 
Um, there's lots of great videos of him. Um, very, very eloquent man. Thank you, Suzanne. Okay. Who posted so, that? Suzanne Mallory. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think that's the one I saw. Okay, so God alone is perfect. That's what Moses wanted people never to forget. Even the greatest human is not perfect. Moses sinned. We still do not know what his sin was. There are many opinions, but that is why God told him he would not enter the promised land. No human is infallible. Perfection belongs to God alone. Only when we honor this essential difference between heaven and earth can God be God and humans human. So remember, what supposedly did Moses do to deserve being kept out of the promised land? Kill the uh, yeah. Egyptian. Well, that could be a reason, and that certainly is listed as one of the reasons the rabbis speculate. He struck the rock in order to get water. Right. The most immediate reason seems to be that God said, talk to the rock, get the water out of it, and Moses hit the rock. Now, but in hitting the rock, a couple of things happened. First of all, Moses says, shall we, meaning him and Aaron, get water from the rock for you? In other words, in a way, disrespecting God because the water coming from the rock was supposedly from God. Then God said, speak to it, and he hit it. He hit it very hard, meaning that twice, as a matter of fact, meaning that his anger issue is still a problem. He also said to the people, you rebels, meaning he's sick and tired of them by now. So there are a lot of different possibilities for why he was not allowed to enter the land and it's never completely clear. It may be all of the above. Okay, so what Suzanne said about that YouTube is, is, is this is why I am a Jew is what that YouTube is. And it was in a, in a group uh, class on Thursday night that Rabbi Lotker is teaching. Remember Rabbi Michael Lotker? He's been mm -hmm. to the temple a few times. Thank you. Okay. So number four, there is more than one way of living a good life. Even Moses, the greatest of men, could not lead alone. He needed the peacemaking skills of Aaron, the courage of Miriam, and the support of the 70 elders. See, now what's really lovely about Jonathan Sachs here is that Aaron, of course, was Moses's mouthpiece. Because as you remember, at the burning bush, Moses said, I can't speak. Mm -hmm. And God said, well, your brother will be with you. So, and also Aaron's a peacemaker. Remember with golden calf, he appeases the people by building mm -hmm. the golden calf. But usually people don't even mention Miriam. And when he says the courage of Miriam, what is he referring to? It starts very early in Moses' life. Well, when, she takes when care of When he was on the basket. Exactly. Yeah. When, right. His mother put him in the basket mm -hmm. and Miriam, followed it. Yeah. Miriam stood by, watched mm -hmm. it. And when the princess finds the basket, she right away gives the mm -hmm. princess a whole plan for how to take care of this baby. Mm -hmm. She basically returns him to his family. Absolutely. The mother is going to become the you know nursemaid or mm -hmm. um, And that takes guts when you're a slave go speak to the princess and say, hey, by the way, you know, I got some ideas for you. <laughs> so I, I like the fact that he's actually giving Miriam some kavod here, which mm -hmm. doesn't happen all that much with, you know, uh, Orthodox men. Okay. Uh, we should never ask, why am I not as great as X? We each have something, a skill, a passion, a sensitivity that makes or could make us great. The greatest mistake is trying to be someone else instead of being yourself. So in other words, Moses was great, but he wasn't all powerful, all everything. He needed the help of some other people. And that's okay because we each have something to uh, offer, which is why there's a lovely interpretation in Sukkot about what the lulav represents. You know, you've got the palm branch and you've got the myrtle and, and the willow and the etrog. And they each represent, you know, they're different interpretations, but one interpretation is that one represents the person who has oh, Torah knowledge, but no, oh, there's a cat. Uh, the person who has Torah knowledge, but no uh, mitzvot or acts of loving kindness. The person that does have acts of loving kindness, but not no Torah knowledge. 
the person who has both, the person who has neither, and all together they form a community. They're all needed. So you need everybody in a community and each person has something to offer. So Moses, you know, was willing to take the um, help of his brother and sister. Never lose the idealism of youth. The Torah says of Moses that at the age of 120, his eye was undimmed and his natural energy unabated. That's what we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. You can still be vital, even at 120. Mm -hmm. I used to think these were two complementary phrases until I realized that the first is the explanation of the second. Moses' eye was undimmed means he never lost the passion for justice that he had as a young man. It is there as vigorous in Deuteronomy as it was in Exodus. We are as young as our ideals. Give way to cynicism and you rapidly age. At the burning bush, Moses said to God, I am not a man of words, I'm heavy of speech. By the time we reach Devarim, which is Deuteronomy, but Devarim in Hebrew means words. Moses has become the most eloquent of prophets. Some are puzzled by this. They shouldn't be. God chose one who is not a man of words so that when he spoke, people realized that it was not he who was speaking, but God who was speaking through him. Hmm. Well, that's one interpretation, right? You could also interpret that he grew and developed. And by the way, one of the explanations of his speech problem is that he stuttered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we know from Joe Biden, for example, that you can be a stutterer and overcome that. Uh, Rabbi Richard Levy of Blessed Memory, who was the head of the rabbinic program when I was in school, also was a stutterer. Now he did not overcome it as well as Joe Biden because he did occasionally stutter, but most of the time he spoke very eloquently. So I think this is a great metaphor for being able to overcome obstacles and challenges, whether they're physical, you know, stuttering or, you know, maybe needing to use a wheelchair or whatever it is, or, you know, emotional or whatever, you know, that you can overcome those things. So, I think that's a beautiful metaphor, you know, of Moses being able to do that. But for Rabbi Sachs, it's a way to show that the words he's speaking are actually God's words. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then God also chose a couple who could not have children, Abraham and Sarah, to become parents of the first Jewish child, again, to show God's power, because you know, there are a lot of women in the, in the Bible who are barren until God, quote, opens their womb. So it shows God's power. And that's also why God chose people not conspicuous for their piety to become God's witnesses in the world. In other words, hey, guess what? The Israelites aren't the greatest. But if they can finally get to the point where they believe in God, so much the more so for people who are greater. The highest form of greatness is to open yourselves to God, that his blessings flow through us to the world. That is how the priests blessed the people. It was not their blessing. They were the channel of God's blessing. The highest achievement to which we can aspire is to open ourselves to others and to God in love, that something greater than ourselves flows through us. So God specifically chose limited people in one way or another so God could prove God's power and blessing. Oh, seven, yeah, didn't I have seven before? Yeah, okay, seven, Moses defended the people. Did he like them? Did he admire them? Was he liked by them? The Torah leaves us in no doubt as to the answers to those questions. Yet he defended them with all the passion and power at his disposal. Even when they had sinned, even when they were ungrateful to God, even when they made a golden calf, he risked his life to do so. He said to God, and now forgive them, and if not, blot me out of the book you have written. So in other words, this is what we were referring to in an earlier Midrash that we read, that Moses pleads with God to not wipe out the people and says, wipe me out instead. And now he's being basically faced with the same choice according to that Midrash, okay? God says, I'll let you live, but I'll kill them. No, don't do that. The leaders worthy of admiration are those who defend the people, even the non-Orthodox, even the secular, even those whose orthodoxy is a different shade from theirs. See, he's talking about coming from modern orthodoxy. And he's saying, you know, if you're a leader, like he was the rabbi of Great Britain, the chief rabbi, then all Jews are his flock. 
not just those who believe in the same way as he does. The people worthy of respect are those who give respect. You treat people with respect, they're likely to treat you with respect. So Moses may not have liked the people, you know, they were paying the net, but he still defended them, even when they really did bad things. The greatest tribute the Torah gives Moses is to call him Eved Hashem, the servant of God. And Eved, by the way, means also slave. We were Avadim Hayinu. That's what we say at uh, Passover. We were slaves, but then we became Avadim of God, servants of God. That is why the Rambam, which is Maimonides, writes that we can all be as great as Moses because we can all serve. We are as great as the causes we serve. And when we serve with true humility, a force greater than ourselves flows through us, bringing the divine presence into the world. So that's a lovely, lovely tribute to um, Moses and to the Torah. Mm. Any comments? Because we could start reading a little bit uh, of the Ha'azinu if you want. But if anyone has any comments, I don't want to stop us. Okay, so you were asking about the song. That's the next piece, Ha'azinu which is the next chapter. And this is the last Torah portion that we read in Temple in the cycle. There's also one after that, but we read that at Simchat Torah. Okay, so this is now Moses's poem, song, whatever, same thing in Hebrew. The word is the same for both. And um, does somebody want to read? I can read. Thank you, Sandy. Listen, you heavens, and I will speak. Hear you, earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching fall like rain, and my words descend like dew, like showers in the new grass, like abundant rain on tender plants. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of, of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. They are co corrupt and not his children. To their shame, they are a warped and crooked generation. In this way, you repay the Lord, you foolish and unwise people. Is he not your father, your creator, who made you and formed you? Remember the days of old, consider the generations long past. Ask your father and he will tell you, your elders, and they will explain to you. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, he set up boundaries for the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob his allotted inheritance. Thank you. Okay. I'm just gonna stop there. Um, I'm going to read you <clears throat> some commentary about this. So what, what is this about uh, calling heaven and earth to witness? What is, what is that about, do you think? Why is what heaven and earth being called to witness against them, by the way? Were well, they the first things that God created? That's a good point. Okay, good. So it says here, this is the commentary, the uh, JPS commentary by T. Gay, that <clears throat> earlier in Deuteronomy, which was a long time ago, heaven and earth are also invoked as witnesses to the covenant. And they're also invoked as instruments of punishment for violation of the covenant. According to the Sifre, which is one of the midrashes on um, this book, Moses invoked them as witnesses because they are eternal and could refute Israel if after his death, it should deny having accepted the covenant. Again, metaphor, but in a very concrete way, right? These are the eternal things. They were the first things created, right? Heaven and earth. And should you decide to claim that you are not a party to this covenant, they will bear witness against you. I mean, these are his parting words, which is a little bit different from that midrash we read, where mm. he's asking for forgiveness and all, and it's all beautiful and lovely, right? This is another one of those, like, by the way, in case I haven't given you enough warning about strain, who's playing the piano? 
I think it's a yeah. ringtone, somebody's yeah. ringtone. It's an interesting ringtone. Okay, <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> just one last warning before we go. According to the Midrash Tanhuma, Moses summoned them to punish Israel with drought and crop failure if it should violate the covenant on the principle that the hand of the witnesses should be the first to act against the violator. So the way that's interpreted is heaven and earth. Remember, we, we've we read this in Deuteronomy. We've read this in other places that <clears throat> should we not follow the commandments, heaven is going to stop raining. Hmm. The earth will dry up. You will starve and die. If you follow the commandments, it'll rain. And I'm sorry for this um, very so nasty stuff for those who were trying to get away from the Christian notion of uh, hell and brimstone, yeah. or fire and brimstone, because we do have some of this in here. Um, but again, I like to look at it more uh, figuratively than, but anyway, he's basically saying heaven and earth are there, right? That's mm -hmm. what you depend on in a place where we have to depend on rain and not on a river overflowing to fertilize our land and to irrigate it. We're going to have to make sure that uh, the rain comes down. And the way we do that is by being good people. There are already a lot of starving people now. Yes, and they don't deserve it. <clears throat> However, that's yeah. not what Deuteronomy would say. So now in this poem, of course, heaven and earth is not being called to punish, but we already know from earlier places that that is how they're used. So it could be a way to echo that. Um, <clears throat> so here, according to, you know, certain scholars, they're employed as a literary device, functioning as objective onlookers who witness the justice of the poem's charges and the fairness of Israel's punishment. You know, again, you know, Moses is saying you're, you're just really evildoers. Um, and then the other thing, oh, the, the, the picture of dew, I think that's really beautiful. I mean, some of this is very beautiful. Some of it is kind of scary, but um, we have May my discourse come down as the rain. What does that suggest? My discourse come down as rain. What does that suggest? And what kind of rain you're thinking of, doesn't it? True. I mean, they're really he very heavy storms. And then there's those light storms that we really enjoy where you go out in the rain and you feel that you're a part of nature and the teachings I think that's what he has in mind, should be like that, that it's just this light rain from heaven, which you absorb into yeah. your body and your brain. I think that's, I think that is what he is trying to express, that it, it comes down gently and penetrates little by little, right? The teaching is not something you're going to just embrace all in one fell swoop. It's like when I talk to people who are interested in converting and they want to do uh, like I was talking to somebody the other day, wanting to do all kinds of misvote all at once, I say, let's do a little bit at a time, you know, and see what, what speaks to you. And I think that's the same idea here, is that the Torah is something, you know, that we're not going to get in one fell swoop. So it's like rain, it penetrates little by little, <clears throat> and it's gentle. Because I also think, Rabbi, my own personal experience has been that since we review Torah every year, we review the whole Torah every year, it's not, even though we're repeating it, it's not boring because we're in a different place. Absolutely. So I think that, that, that that's a compliment to what is being said here is uh, what your res receptivity is. Where are you at this point in reading this on a year-long basis and Absolutely. a lot of times it's like I never read this before you know right. <laughs> and it feels totally new yes absolutely it's where you're coming from also you might have class with other people or you might read a commentary and it might open up a whole new vista on what you're reading that you never noticed before or for mm -hmm. example if you've been studying it all in English and then you start taking Hebrew and you go wait a minute now I notice something in the Hebrew Mm -hmm. So yes, absolutely. We, we never understand it the same way. And if we did, boy, would that be boring. And yeah. my job would be really boring because I'd have to talk mm -hmm. about the Torah portion every year and I have nothing new to say about it. Right. But that's not the case. And you can come at it from so many different angles. And I think 
the way Hebrew poetry works is that you have couplets. So <clears throat> he says, give ear, O heaven, let me speak, let the earth hear the words I utter. So those go together. So heaven and earth are the witnesses. Then the second verse, may my discourse come down as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, those co go together as well. And it's usually some kind of parallelism. So do is also very gentle, right? It, mm -hmm. So I think that that's why the rain is the rain that you described, Jane. I don't think it's a storm because mm -hmm. the second part of it would have been much more like a violent image. So both of them are very gentle, soft images. I mean, do is something that, you know, is on the, on the ground in the morning and it's just a little bit and, it, you know, it's not like you gotta have a flood on, mm -hmm. on your ground. Um, and he says, my, you know, this is his speech too. It's not just the Torah, it's his speech. Let, let this penetrate in a certain kind of way. And then this is also part of that same verse, like showers on young growth, like droplets on the grass. All of it is very gentle. And what, it, what does it do? What, is it, what do these droplets and these showers do? They're penetrating though. They, mm -hmm. they penetrate the, the ground. They don't just sit there on the top in a big puddle. Right. They nourish, they nourish the earth. And they, and they enrich the, the soil. That's right. They, they allow things to grow just the way this Torah teaching can allow you to grow on a spiritual level. So that part of it, and you know, for the name of the Lord, I proclaim, give glory to our God. That's all really beautiful. Um, and then the rock, his deeds are perfect. Yea, all his ways are just. Okay, that's nice. A faithful God never false, true and upright is he. If you if you go back to look at these verses, mm -hmm. you'll see these couplets where there's parallelism in each one of these verses. But then we get to the part that ain't so nice. Children unworthy of God. So look at how wonderful God is, and you're completely unworthy. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna have to mute her because we can hear her conversation. <laughs> Rara, can you show the poem again? Sure. So here it is, let my teaching fall like rain, my words to sound like dew, like showers on new grass, like abundant rain on tender plant. Oh, oh well, it's a little slightly different um, translation than the one I was just reading, but <clears throat> see here's God being great in contrast to the corrupt children, warped and crooked. And look how they repay God, right? And God's the creator who formed you. you you could say this to your kids too, right? I'm your parent. I'm the one who made you. How can you be so ungrateful? How can you be such a brat? Is anybody watching The Crown? Yes. So <laughs> I think it's the third, the third or the fourth episode. Um, so Queen Elizabeth, so Margaret Thatcher's son is lost on an expedition in France. He's in some kind of race and they can't find him for several days. And she's just absolutely crushed because he's her favorite child. So Queen Elizabeth decides that she's going to figure out because Philip says to her, well, I know who my favorite is, you know, mm -hmm. and right away, and she's shocked that he, you know, honestly and blatantly has a favorite child. So she decides she's going to see, you know, what her relationship with her children is herself. And so she has a private audience with each one of them. And you can see one after the other, she's so disappointed <laughs> in these children, you know, <clears throat> I mean, they're all entitled, you know, brats in, in many ways, ungrateful for what all the privilege they have. And, you know, then she has, a, you know, a scene with, with Philip where she just says, what do we do wrong as parents, right? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's sort of similar to what's going on here. Like, look what God's done for you and look at you ingrates. How, how can it, you know, how can this be? Um, <clears throat> is this how you pay back all the wonderful things that God has done for you, right? Look at all the wonderful things I've done for you as a parent and look at your ingratitude. Um, and then, you know, remember the days of old, of course, always looking at the past, right? So ask your parents, they'll tell you all the great things that, that God did for you, gave you this wonderful land and, and gave you, you know, a portion for each, each tribe. And then we're gonna go on and, and find out what else God did for us uh, in the desert. Because by the way, the desert becomes 
even though we know from reading Exodus that the desert is not a place where things were lovely and people all got along and loved each other and whatever, it becomes a kind of metaphor for when things were innocent and perfect, which is pretty funny because they weren't. <laughs> but <clears throat> absence makes the heart grow fonder, right? You look back in retrospect and everything looks so much rosier than it really is, right? <laughs> So that's where we'll leave it off for this morning. Uh, harking back to the days of old. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rabbi. So Shabbat very Shalom, nice. everyone. Rabbi. Shabbat Thank shalom. you, Rabbi. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom. shalom. Have shabbat a great shalom. Thanksgiving. I hope uh, safe. Yeah, you too. Have a good Thanksgiving. Thank well, you. Everybody Thank stay you. well, stay safe. When is our next tour study? Does anyone happen to know? I saw I December 12th. I was looking. Uh, that's probably when it is. Okay. Okay. See you All soon. Right. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.